Uh, good evening, everyone in the room, and good evening online. Uh, my name is Adam Hems. I'm the leader of the group, uh, the Houston Azure User Group, um, uh, which has been my pleasure to do for the last um, eight years, I think. Now it's uh, yeah, it's been it's it's been been a while. Not my first rodeo. <laughs> done this uh, a few times now. We've had a lot of fun presentations in a mul multiple uh, multiple places. So. Is any, I see a lot of familiar faces uh, here tonight. Has anyone not been here? I know some of you are here for the first time in person, or at least first time. Okay, all right. Did you did you watch any of the recordings? No, not yet. So that means you get to hear the, uh, the short history of what this group is about. So this, um, I need to turn. The, the, the room is mic'd, so. I don't know if you can hear it online. Just, uh, just don't on that. Just don't. I'll just, I'll just speak loud. You can hear. Me. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, the purpose of this group uh, is for learning. Right? So my, my day job, uh, I'm a cloud architect at Microsoft. That's what I do. Because I like working with uh, cloud technology and have done since 2007. I had an AWS account uh, in 2007, my first one. Well, that was cool. What a, what a cool technology. Uh, I still have it. It's still cool. Um, I was at the launch of Azure in 2010, and uh, that's really when I decided that uh, this this is this is where it's at. So I spent a few years trying to spend as much time as possible. Uh, knit in. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Good to see you. Welcome back. Um, so I spent a few years uh, focusing on cloud, and really I've been working full time uh, on public cloud technologies since about 2013 uh, and I love it it's uh, it's fun uh, it, I've loved how much it has changed uh, which is I mean back uh, back when I was helping customers in the current role as my, my job as a CSA in 2015 when I started doing this as a you know trusted advisor Azure was uh, easily small enough so that one person could learn every feature the thing had I mean all of it easily uh, and the best practices irrespective of VMs and web apps and the data science stuff, networking, all of it. The SQL database, it was all there and it was easy to learn the whole thing. It really, it really, really was. And that is completely impossible right now, even though it's my day job, it is far, far too big. So it's interesting to see uh, the growth uh, and the complexity uh, as well, right? It's uh, easy to use if we follow the quick starts, but not so much if you do it properly, uh, so it, it's been a it's been a fun journey, um, and so I like as part of my day job just talking about this technology with lots of different folks. Um, but this this uh, meetup here is an opportunity for others to learn from each other, right? Rather than do that as my day job, it's about um, uh, just uh, opportunities to to share and learn, and get different experiences from different folks um, or, or industry. Any oil and gas folks uh, in the room today? No. Couple of oil and gas folks ish. Um, consulting, as we often get consulting folks, some consulting folks. Hands like this. <laughs> uh, healthcare, there we go. All right, yeah. Uh, healthcare, anyone else? Technology, generally speaking, maybe a bit of everything, a bit of all of it. Yeah, more of it. What about uh, any developers in the room? Okay, there we go. There we go. That's more like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a developer background, wrote a lot of code. Still write a little bit of code for fun because it's kind of cool, but you know, did write a lot of code. Infrastructure, any infrastructure folks? Nick didn't put his hand up twice there, which is legit. That is legit. And that's honestly part of the, you know, you've got to learn the whole, a bit of it. DBAs, SQL databases, Nick's going to put his hand up. That's fine. Uh, DBAs or um, uh, security folks. Yeah, okay. Nick in everything. Uh, Jack of all trades, DevOps. Uh, DevOps, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, please go see that. Yeah. <laughs> bit of everything. So we do find a lot of folks tend to specialize. Others need to do a bit of everything. It's uh, it's, it's a broad. So learning from uh, each other's experiences is is what we're all about here. So um, tonight's food, one of the hardest parts about food is getting sponsors for food, is sponsored by BJSS, which is the happens to be the employee. You're going to talk about BJSS a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So thank you to BJSS for sponsoring tonight's food. Stopping us from all being hungry. We really appreciate that. Um, all right. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our speaker tonight. Dan? This guy. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, is, yeah. your... is that working? 
Oh, hey. There we go. Magic. Mm -hmm. I can oh, slide down if you want. I just know you, you're, you're good. Uh, you. Thursday, yeah. Thank, is that right? It sounds very echoey. That sounds great. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, yes, my name is Daniel White. I'm from BGSS. And today uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Bicep and just as a developer, how we can use kind of Bicep and automation and these kind of things to hopefully speed up the process by which we kind of start projects, by which we can kind of break down the silos between dev teams and DevOps teams, and just generally kind of have a bit of a knowledge sharing exercise. Um, so start off with, same slide, there we go. Uh, so a little bit about BGSS, just kind of while we start, where I won't turn it into a sales pitch. This is us, we are a IT consultancy based out of the UK. About 30 years kind of experience, we work across any kind of domain. Um, we've got all our different service offerings on the big uh, service offering wheel up there. We literally wrote the book on Enterprise Agile. Uh, we won an award for that book. You can see the technology and engineering kind of spoke, that's myself. Uh, the other one that I really like on there is sustainability. And over at Microsoft has a great guy, um, Asim, I believe his name is. Um, he does is brilliant, uh, so I definitely check him out. But it's a hugely growing uh, service offering that we kind of have, and it's one that's kind of going across all of what we do. Because let's face it, we are in a very disruptive industry, uh, and anything we can do to make it better is good. Uh, down at the bottom there, there is a QR code. We do have a data and innovation kind of workshop that's kind of ongoing. We'll be hosting that kind of at the Ion, and we've got it going on up at our New York office, so feel free to grab a picture of that kind of code up there. We are, you know, in the partnership with kind of Microsoft and AWS and these kind of things. So we do kind of work across as many different kind of cloud platforms as we can. Um, I see some people taking pictures of that. I'll leave it for a second. Okay. Uh, so why am I kind of stood here? Well, like uh, Adam kind of said, my name is Daniel Wright, and a principal technologist for BGSS Houston. That basically just means I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, kind of get involved with everything. Um, I came over here about three years ago, got here March 2020, so just as kind of COVID was hitting, which was quite nice um, because I literally got to see the inside of an apartment for about a year and nothing else of Houston. Mm -hmm. Generally thought Houston had nothing to offer for the first year because there was nobody outside. Um, but it's, that's kind of changed, that's kind of got better. I've been at BJSS now for about six years worked across kind of things all the way from kind of financial oil and gas to, you know, retail and all these other kind of things. Um, started life as a front end developer. And I've seen the kind of been firsthand seen the shift in kind of how understanding um, cloud platforms and how we work in these kind of environments is, you know, is pivotal now. You can't literally do your job day to day, I don't think, without somebody kind of saying something to you about whether it's just looking at a pipeline whether it's looking at the infrastructure we're kind of running and certainly kind of when we start thinking about spinning up and starting projects for people, it's hugely important in those kind of spin zeros. So uh, that's my LinkedIn QR code. Um, it's very little on there, but my wife will tell you she's drastically trying to get me to get a better online presence. Um, <laughs> so uh, feel free to connect out to me and say hello. So I came to uh, one of these meetups in October and it was the first time that I heard about Bicep. I had never kind of done anything. We've done a little bit of Terraform before, but I'd never really done anything kind of with Bicep as a developer. I remember asking Tony, I'm at the back over there, what it was. Um, he told me, and every year I set myself kind of goals. I kind of have some kind of technical goals. I have some kind of soft skill goals. And one, uh, well, apart from my ever going goal of learning Rust, I had a goal this year of learning Bicep. So what you're about to see is kind of the demo is all based off me tinkering with Bicep in the background. It is quite a lot of demo. I did uh, badger Adam with it for half an hour today. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, this basically is just proof of how much you can kind of do with Bicep really. And as a developer, I found it hugely important. It's now become a staple of my pet projects or my pet projects now kind of have this kind of automation in it so that I don't have to kind of be using things just to kind of locally, I can actually kind of see it in situ. And I think with the way that we've kind of moved with kind of Docker and Kubernetes and all this kind of containerization of stuff, 
when we kind of do things and it's kind of like actually it runs on my machine or I'm doing a PSC for somebody and it's on my machine, I think we really should be kind of looking towards actually saying here's some resource and we can kind of actually deploy it rather than just kind of still been in this world where it's acceptable to do stuff kind of on our local machine. So with that being said, let's get into a couple of two minutes of thesis as why I think it's so good. So this is a quote from a man whose books I'm just absorbing at the moment, the fantastic Patrick Lencioni. He basically, in his book, The Advantage, says that organizational health will one day surpass all of the disciplines in business as the greatest opportunity for improvement and competitive advantage. And I believe it. You know, I, when we have kind of teams that are siloed and we have teams that are kind of off doing their own kind of thing, it doesn't breed the kind of the way in which we want to really be working. We kind of see teams doing their own thing. We don't get the knowledge sharing. They're kind of siloed in their own kind of thing. And we need to kind of have teams working together to get the best out of kind of things. On the left hand side, the little picture down there, I, I liken it to back in the day, there was dev. And dev did kind of everything, really. And then obviously our disciplines started getting bigger and bigger. And we got front end, back end, functional, non-functional people, and the whole kind of gambit. And somewhere along the line, DevOps popped up. I'm guessing it was once this man who was in charge of the flashing lights on servers that was in the basement somewhere. And while dev and the team was forming, <laughs> DevOps just kind of moved away. And I, I think it's an anti pattern. I'm going to go out there and say it's a, a bit of an anti pattern. I don't understand why we have somebody or a team that is so integral to the release of production stuff in a kind of a one to many relationship. One, one person might be responsible for multiple teams and things like this. I don't necessarily think it's the kind of the best way. And the worst part of this is I think a lot of the time, they get stuck behind a ticketing system. They get stuck behind the idea that they are the gatekeepers for innovation and this stuff, anything to do with the cloud, when really they should be the facilitators to kind of helping the team. And in such, I think we've seen this pattern play out with testers. I think testers are quite often passed around between teams, but you get the best out of testers when you have a dedicated test presence on a team that you can kind of deliver in your software development lifecycle. And I think DevOps should be seen as part of a team. I don't think it should be. And to be quite honest, I have filled in tickets for places where I've needed to speak to the DevOps people to know how to fill in the ticket so that I can pass it to the DevOps person so they can get back in touch with me to ask me what the problem was. And it's a frustrating kind of cycle of just two teams that kind of should be working together that aren't necessarily. So, that's my bit of a, a bugbear. That's my kind of a bit of a thing with it. And I think we can do better. Now, the idea about generating a thematic goal, this is another one of kind of Patrick's kind of statements. And the idea here is really that the best teams that operate without, or the best like, yeah, teams that operate without kind of this kind of siloed mentality are teams that are in crisis, teams that have uh, a shared objective and a shared kind of passion for what they can kind of do you know so the idea is that first responders and things don't necessarily kind of feel fire you have firefighters these kind of things that are kind of under a lot of pressure so the idea here being that if we can create a goal that we can share between dev teams and devops teams that isn't just oh, i need to get this kind of released because that's your day to day i think that ultimately is just kind of what a lot of these devops people seem to be doing is firefighting between these kind of teams and picking up pieces Sarah Dresner's book, Engineering Management for the Rest of Us, another great book. She talks about this 70-30 kind of split between engineering and production, and I fundamentally believe in this. And if you are going to be kind of running a team and kind of can incorporate this into your team, then you can use that 30% of your time that's not on developing production to be doing innovation. And I think the best benefits of kind of having innovation and these kind of things are, you know, you'll have this kind of opportunity for sharing, your knowledge sharing, You'll get teams that are a bit more kind of close knit and kind of, you know, have better relationships, upskilling, cross-functional work, and then these kind of things. That's a thesis out of the way. Uh, so my suggestion really, or my kind of, you know, way of wanting to, now that I've been playing with Bicep, is to use infrastructure of code and Bicep to not have the DevOps teams be almost like the keepers of kind of, you know, you can do this, but to actually kind of help 
enforce the standards by which developers can kind of come along and just go, I want A, B, and C, and off they go to kind of deliver it. So for those who aren't familiar with it, infrastructure as code is just basically kind of creating a source set of source code that can be used multiple times to kind of deliver the same kind of infrastructure across kind of any platform. It's idempotent as well, which is I suppose the key point there. So you'll always get the same results by kind of delivering it. Uh, Bicep is Microsoft's DSL for doing all this kind of stuff. It's very de declarative, you can deploy things in parallel, built really on top of ARM templates. So you can kind of build uh, ARM templates from Bicep and Bicep can be decompiled into ARM. What's an, what's an ARM template? Uh, an Azure Resource Manager. Azure, yeah, Resource Manager template. It's basically a big piece of SQL that has a schema at the top of it. I believe uh, my screen's just gone blank. Yeah. yeah. By, by uh, environments that are hmm. the same, do you mean that they have uh, the actual same data or the well, same structure? You can put what data you want into it, but ultimately, if you're kind of making something like I'll kind of show in a second, like a function app, you can have, you can determine what kind of SKU you want, so what kind of compute you want to kind of be running it on. So you can write some code and you can continually deploy the same kind of thing. So your organization can determine, we don't want to spend anything above like this kind of tier or this kind of level of compute power on this. And every time you run it, you will get the same kind of thing. If you want to be putting data into it, you can just automatically then kind of run some kind of ORM kind of things on it and put data into it, but it will give you the same environment, the same infrastructure every time you kind of run it. Given that you give it the same parameters into it, you can, you know, obviously that can be determined. Um, yeah, and you can deploy it via the command line or through a DevOps pipeline, and we're going to do both in a second. And then CI CD. This is the bit as a developer I tend to get to play with most. And we'll be using the DevOps kind of stuff to kind of do this. So this is just about reusable stages so that you can build, test, you can, you can merge your code. It, it, the nice thing about this is you can fail fast and early in these kind of pipelines. So you can pick up any kind of problems before you've actually got this kind of code deployed. We're going to be using YAML files for all of this um, because developer. Um, and then we're going to use service connections. Service connections being one of the integral pieces of allowing the authentication into your subscription from your pipeline. So I've got a little bit of a demo of a few different things, but the final piece of the resistance is I'm going to do all of this with a click of a button. I'm going to deploy, well, a couple of clicks, but I'm going to deploy all of that as your infrastructure with a piece of bicep. Yes. What is that, please? That's my, that's my beautiful architecture. <laughs> so I don't recognize those icons. What, what, so are they? what we've got here is kind of on the right. So on the left hand side, we have a, a, the icon for bicep and an icon for some JavaScript. And that's basically going to be stored within our uh, Azure DevOps repos. So we've got different kind of repos for these kind of things. So we can use source control for any kind of changes that we want. Hugely important, again, if we're going to be kind of changing and playing with things. Um, that little spaceship, that's our DevOps pipelines. So we're going to run pipelines that are going to take our source control or source code, and they're going to build it, and then they're going to deploy it. And the little kind of Azure symbol, what we've got there is we've got two web apps. So we'll have a UI and API. So the UI is a React UI. The API is a Node Express API. We've got a function app, and then the Node, uh, the Express API, is going to be speaking to our flexible Postgres server. So everything that you see on the left hand side is going to be controlled by one bicep. It's not one file because it's going to be split out into modules, but we'll kind of see how that kind of goes. Everything on the left hand side is just going to be running within our pipelines and the arrow between the left and the right hand side, that's going to be our service connection. And it's going to basically just handle the authentication so we don't have to keep authenticating into uh, and doing these kind of things. Any questions? Yes, sir. What, what is that cylinder that has an elephant? Oh, that's our Postgres. That's my Postgres DB. Oh, but okay. it's there to represent my flexible Postgres server. What Postgres? Postgres is a like a SQL server. It's a relational database. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know it in depth enough to know the difference really between my SQL and Postgres, but they basically do the same kind of thing. Um, in my mind, <laughs> one, 
I was about to say, I, I was going to go with one I use more than the other one. So, <laughs> um, so yes, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, so with that being said, I'm going to check on. So, can you all see? Can you make that bigger? Uh, yes. I can see it, but it's control maybe. plus. Oh, I'm actually not in the one that I wanted. So, and it's still not. Shift plus will work. You're on Mac, right? I are, yeah, unfortunately. So. Command plus, sorry. Okay. If, uh, while Dan does that, if anyone online has questions, you should be able to come off mute and just ask a question. Uh, or I'm monitoring the chat here as well. In case you... That's what I want. Okay. Um, had to shift uh, shift plus. I'm oh, sorry, command plus. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Command plus. Mm -hmm. Or no. Oh. Zoom, maybe you see that zoom. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's that looks great. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right. Okay. So, what we're going to start with is we've got this. So, this here is the. So, I've got four different ways now of writing Bicep to deploy a function app. So, we're going to do this through the command line to start with. And the first way is the probably the simplest way. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do, we're just going to write this all in one file. So for those that kind of haven't seen Bicep, you can get the schemas online for all of this kind of stuff. Um, let's see if I can find one of these kind of schemas. Well, actually, there'll be a schema in one of the other things. Um, and what it'll basically tell you to do is, because uh, a function app is a platform as a service kind of offering, we can have our function app, but we need to host it somewhere, and we need a so that's our hosting plan and we need a storage account as it says there because it manages the triggers and the logging and these kind of things so at its simplest each of these is just a resource and as you can see each of these resources has a fairly standard way of kind of saying it so this is the name of the resource that you want so Microsoft storage this is a storage account it gets a bit more complicated when you start having different years in them but there's not too many and you give it a name, you give it a location of where it's going to live. This is the SKU, so this is the stock keeping unit. This is basically your kind of what you're paying for almost. Um, and then certain different properties that kind of go down. Um, and then again, we've got the web. This is the server farm, so this is the hosting plan that's going to run it all. Um, and then our function app kind of down at the bottom here. So again, we just pass in a load of stuff. And if you're familiar with working with function apps and stuff, you'll see that some of these kind of app settings that we're looking at kind of here. So this is the runtime of it. So we're going to put it on a node. It's going to have a node runtime. It's going to be node 18. Um, and then this is one of my favorite things about Bicep, is you can basically tell it the origin. You can get all the core stuff straight out of the box, and you can tell it what you want to do. And then there's a load more kind of other stuff that you need. To run this, it's quite simple. Got a question? Go for it. So in terms of storing, how do you avoid storing secrets in that thing? I saw like connection strings you were passed into a function. Uh, That'd be bad. Don't put secrets in there, right? Connection strings, where are we looking here? Yeah. Here. Ah. Uh, yes. So if I was to be, so you can externalize all of your config, which we kind of will get to kind of seeing on later. I think if you were to be kind of doing all of this kind of properly secrets and stuff, you would probably want externalized in some kind of key vault. I don't really know would be best practice for where you'd store that. But what's your suggestion? Where would you? Okay. 
uh, yeah, yeah, you'd pull it from a from a, from like a keyboard yeah. and, yeah. and and pop it and, and populate the values of the parameters file. Uh, perhaps if you're doing it from DevOps, you populate the parameters uh, from uh, environment variables okay. you set in the build pipeline. Uh, that way, it'd never be stored. So, ah, well. One of the neat things, I suppose, that I might not be able to kind of show, I might be able to do it with the bicep one, is that you can have, um, this is a bit of a digression now, but there is a, so you can have these um, tags at the beginning of it, and one of these tags is called secure. Um, and you can use the secure tag for, as you say, if you want login passwords and things and you're setting it. So that will stop it from getting shown in the output, which I shall show you in a second. But yeah, so to kind of run this, what we're going to do, because we're going to put this function up and all of its contents in something, we're going to create a... So I'm hoping that's in the, that's not in the value folder. So we're going to run. Oh, going to run this in here. So what we should hopefully see. You make the font a little bit bigger. If I if yeah. I said no, we'd. Ah, there you go. That's better. Keep going. Is that alright? Bit more. Yeah, it's good. That's okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So what we can see now is we have run. So uh, okay. So I'm using all the AZ. So this is the um, the Azure uh, command line tool. I quite like this. This is quite uh, it's quite neat. So all we're doing here is we're creating a resource group called Function App Group One, and we're doing it in location East US. Now, what that's done is it's created an empty shell. What we can then do is we can take our actual deployment of our bicep template file. We can stick that into, put that in there. And hopefully, if that succeeds, yeah, we can go into here. So is that all right? Is that yeah, really it's great. It's great. So that was the function app resource group that we've just created. Now uh, function app group are one and inside here we have a method. It normally doesn't take very long to kind of go. Just make sure it hasn't died. It is running. Yes. It worried me that for a minute because it didn't have a spinner. Is it saying yellow? You need a new bicep? Just um, upgrade it, basically. So. <laughs> always the way. It's always something that needs upgrading. So when this runs, uh, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to see everything kind of in here. In the meantime, uh, the reason I like doing these kind of things, and we'll see in a bit, we can automatically create resource groups is because a lot of the time we work within a subscription. I very rarely kind of work <laughs> multi-subscription. I typically kind of work within one subscription and just have lots of different resource groups in there. But you can then, I can have these kind of cost alerts and these kind of cost analysis and things there and things. So you can put alerts as to kind of what everything is on it. So from my top level where the idea, if we go back to kind of what I was kind of thinking, so you can see what we've kind of been spending here and it's kind of just rapidly going up these kind of the last couple of days. So if you go back to kind of what I was thinking about the kind of idea about creating 
a shared way of working in which we can kind of drive innovation. We can kind of basically have our DevOps teams setting up the kind of SKUs and the kind of the things that we want all of our biceps to be running off. Why won't you go into? Are these only uh, human resource groups or do they also include other types of resources? So this is all infrastructure kind of resource groups. So it's nothing to do with your AD credentials or anything like this. This is where you will have, as we'll see in a kind of a second. So down here, these resource groups um, has all of my function app contents in it. So that's what we've just deployed with the code. So what we've now done is we've created a template to creating a function app that anybody can run at the command line that's kind of had its own, that's all of the properties, as we're kind of we'll ignore those kind of properties that you might want to be, you could have them out of a key vault or somewhere, but all of the kind of a size of the hosting plan and the size of the storage account can all be set at your organizational level. If your organization doesn't want to spend much money and it wants to use these kind of things for, uh, development and innovation and these kind of, and they want to be throwaway, you can reduce all of your costs in here. And you can basically say then to developers or anybody that kind of wants the function up, here you go, here's a template that's been organization approved. You go off and you kind of run it. And that's the easiest way to create it. That's the easiest straight out of the box way. There's, you know, there's not a whole lot really to do in that. It's quite a, quite a good way. You could also create the resource group from the bicep as well. If you created the definition of the resource group in there, you would you wouldn't need to create that first. So uh, <laughs> you run into some fun trying to. Well, you 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 kind of stolen stolen my thunder uh, a little bit. So this one here, oh, called, sorry. this sorry. one here that I've called command. Uh, so this we'll get to see at a later. Why won't you just? Well, you're <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's do back. Um, is it just about readable? Anyway, I suppose we'll get back to this file in a second. But you can, at the top of these files, define your target scope. In this target scope, this was for subscription. So what I was basically saying in here was go off to that subscription and make me a resource group. Here's my resource sandbox group, and that's a resource group. Um, and then you can do it from the top there. The problem I found with this was when I stuck it in a pipeline, I couldn't really work out how to set target scope while in my DevOps pipeline. So I just hacked around that. But again, I shall show you that in a second. But if I was to run this from a command line, I don't need a resource group. I can just run this one file and it will set up that resource group and then put all the resources in it, which is a nice way of kind of demonstrating that you can have this depends on at the bottom of things. And then you can, where we were talking about, you can run these in parallel. You can basically stage these so that it doesn't run mm -hmm. until that resource group has been created. But that was Adam jumping his ahead. All right. And that's quite all right. Um, I suppose the thing to do now with this is before we finish it, we'll just delete it as well. So, One question before you do. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So I'm accustomed to Terraform. Okay, yeah. And the most interesting thing about Terraform is its plan. So can you show something about Bicep's ability to not destroy your production environment? Well, you don't have to have this anywhere near so in ways or oh, you're gonna have to probably explain this to me because i'm not yeah the the, the way that the, you, you can pretty much like do the test run okay kind of like a dry run before before uh, doing anything yes. and, and i know the bicep has it so yeah it does there is a command line tool where you can basically kind of get it to do that okay watch it, it's yeah, it that's, that's the one yeah all right i was kind of thinking that you might be referring to running the same piece of bicep on existing kind of infrastructure and it just kind of blatting and overriding it. Well, that's, that's the too. scary part. That's the, when scary. the thing is called production, that's yeah. that's okay. my life and it's pretty scary. Like, so I've not done that. Kind of like a what if scenario. Okay. No, I know it does have it. So. It does. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there will be, so you can use the what if stuff to kind of predetermine before you kind of go there. So it will kind of give you a bit of a, an overview of what will happen. Um, but yeah, I've, Interestingly, I never thought to run one over the top of one and just see what happened. So, 
It's idempotent, so it should, it'll only change. Don't worry, it's things. idempotent. It'll delete everything and then refresh. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it'll just delete all your data and then create new storage accounts that are empty. I'm, I'm guessing this is from someone that may have done that. No, but uh, so I've had some terrifying moments. Yeah. Terrifying. You could put dot dash dash oh, what if at the end of that. It's um, what minus if here. Pass the pair and then run that. I, I just want to see what it's not going to do. Met somewhere for for such a so uh, yeah, if you want to try it, you may have coming for us like uh, minus minus same stuff or something. What minus, I think it's what minus if. What minus if. I need something in front of the no dot. Yeah, I'd like that. I lie about the what if. No, what is? No, that is not the. Well, it's part of the. Um, oh, it's a uh, AZ deployment group. What minus if it's not at the end? Yeah. Not AZ group because AZ group is part of Azure CLI. This is this is a bicep thing. Uh, okay. I, I can. I don't uh, have well, my computer. Okay, never, yeah, go ahead. Never mind. We don't want to. Yeah, we don't want to totally derail it. I mean, it, it's fun. It's fun for us. We we like it, but it's making it hard for you, Dan. So, so anyway. Was that I said to you earlier? I said, you know, I'm worried. I'm going to get in front of a group of people that know what they're talking about. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. So you 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 can do the what if thing. There's also a, a minus minus debug feature, which is quite handy. It spits out way more stuff than it wants to do. I've used the what if one and it's printed me out a load of kind of green stuff. Right. Uh, and, and, and minus minus debug uh, spits out like every call it's doing. It's quite handy for, you know, getting in the weeds if stuff's broken. Anyway, as you were. OK, so back on track, back in the room. Uh, okay, so then the next stage really from there, we won't deploy all of these, uh, to be honest, because you deploy them all the same apart from the last one. So the next stage then is that you can have, what we'll do is we'll move our config outside of writing it with inside our resources, and then we'll create modules. So modules are the way forward. Uh, personally, they make everything a lot more reusable. And as soon as you start externalizing your config like this, having modules makes it, it makes it a whole lot nicer. So we've got here at the top uh, description. This is the way Microsoft suggests you do it on the kind of the pages is to have these kind of um, config maps at the top. Uh, this is a pretty simple one. It's just for exactly all the stuff that's in kind of here. So this is again just running function app. So I've only got kind of function app stuff in here and I've only got one grouping of it. So we've kind of moved everything out of there. Um, and then we create modules for everything. So a module is just, it's good, you can tell it where the file is, if we want to read, and then we're going to pass in all of the individual kind of properties for uh, that module. So in this case, we've got everything that we did have for each of the three resources. And this makes it really reusable uh, because now at this stage, this is just it's just dummy there's nothing in here that you can take this and you can give it any as long as you meet that kind of config input that set of schema was kind of going into it you can take this and you can use this piece of bicep for anything um well you can give it any kind of properties you want so all we've done is we've replaced all of the actual values with params so perhaps just being some really nice to go for it so is there a concept of module here like Terraform has got modules, so you can define the modules and share those modules. So this is a module oh, now. Okay. So you define it um, as so. This is my function app module at this stage, and you prefix it with module instead of resource. Okay. So and you get a separate file. You put, yeah. So it, well, sorry. Yeah, I thought that was kind of yeah. It's too fast. Um, sorry, is this not? Also, it's a bit, it's a bit small. As well. Yeah, sorry, um, I didn't plan for that. Can you go, I mean, you can go to the edits maybe on the top menu. Where in top, like an edit menu. There you go. Usually, is like a zoom in function there. Probably view, maybe. Yeah. Or view. Increase font size and all that. It was there. It was there. Yeah. Increase. It looks like it's got commands, command shift dot, dot, shift dot, looks like. Yeah, this is interesting. Command shift dot. Does that work? Was it command or was it control? 
or you can just use the same shortcut, go to the view and <laughs> bottom down, 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 to the bottom. That one. There you go. There you go. Okay. That's better. One more time. One more. One more. I think that's alt. That's alt. Does this is very alt or I don't know. I can't muscle yeah. memory. I can't that, remember because you got command and, good, good. and control. Okay. And okay. Right. You know, and then. So yes, so this is modules. If we had more of these kind of modules, you could use this. Uh, depends on again to structure them. So that if you don't have that, you can just deploy it all kind of in parallel. Thank God. Um, and then scoping here, we're going to stick it in the resource group again. So to Indra's question, yeah, these are now your resources. So again, your modules just passing in your params into all your kind of your resources. So that hasn't changed that file. All we've done now is we've taken all of the config out of that file, externalized it, and we've created it, turned it into a module. Third, then, so after we've done that, uh, we can start to use, we can take all of our config further outside of here. So we can actually now kind of have, if we were to have it in a completely different repo somewhere, we could have it kind of owned and maintained by an entirely different team. And we could have that config just injected kind of into, into our file. So at this stage, I have a config file down here. And what you'll see is that config now contains everything that's important. And I've extended it to have a production test and dev kind of section of it. So if we wanted, we could have the environment that we're going to deploy into dev test or production and someone else your DevOps team really can therefore kind of control what we're deploying into so that someone like me doesn't come along and just kind of create whatever they want and we can do lots of other kind of things like we can make sure that key properties like uh, this node here is well and there's an example of it there we can have allowed ones so my param that I'm going to pass in has to be one of these and therefore it'll find that in my config pick the right kind of config so we're now we've now further kind of separated all of our concerns we now have reusable modules which are our kind of resources that get passed in all of the params we now have externalized config that can be hosted and driven by somewhere else so i as a developer can now come along i can just pick this and i can just add however many modules if i wanted two of these kind of modules i could just copy and paste that module run it and i've got two function apps all built exactly the same. Back to your question at the beginning, they're identical. There's nothing kind of that will be changing between them, except Microsoft won't let me because it's all in free tier and uh, I can't abuse its free tier system. So the fourth and the final way of kind of doing this to kind of make it even easier for people is that we'll run all of this through a pipeline. So we'll build an Azure pipeline uh, to do this. So we have, uh, I've hard coded the variables into the top of this, but you could have them passed in as your kind of pipeline when you kind of get to that in the side. I'll show you that in a second. But all we're going to do here is we've created a service connection that allows us to kind of run this and then we run the Azure CLI inside it. So um, yeah, that was a bit of an interesting one because uh, it's a mono repo effectively because it's got lots of things in it. It doesn't just, it likes you to define that. It took me a little while to work that out. Um, and then we're going to deploy it. Old path tripped you up? Yes. Uh, well, specifically because I was expecting it just to be main.bicep because that Azure Pipelines thing is in the same directory level as main.bicep. Whereas, but because it runs it from the root of bicep.funcap, because that's what you're actually kind of running into the pipeline, it would appear. So it takes all of that scenario one, two, three, and four, and it runs it from root. So you have to then kind of go into it. Just took me a minute to work that out. And then there's all the slash S, slash A kind of stuff. If you're not familiar with that, that's a whole load of fun. Um, so yeah, I feel it, it works quite nicely. You just run the same kind of commands. So again, I'm going to run the Azure CLI to build my bicep. And then we are going to deploy that. And then we just, again, run the Azure CLI to create a resource group. And then we actually create <laughs> the function app. So 
hopefully. In, in that last one on that, you know, where you've got the minus minus parameters there, that's where you're passing in the values for your bicep template, right? Yes. Um, and so you have uh, a good way to pass in like secrets uh, at this point. You can have it just as you've got it right there, but you can also add an additional um, minus P for parameter um, and actually put in uh, the, the key and value in the command line right here of uh, a secret value oh, you okay, want it yes. to pass. So it has to exist in the parameters or not, or not, it doesn't have to exist in the parameters file, it has to be a defined parameter like you've got there. But by pushing it in the command line, that overwrites whatever you've got in the parameters file or in the bicep. So you could just have some kind of placeholder in there. And that's a good way you can pass in a secure environment variable there in your build. And that's a good way to securely pass a password all the way through to your infrastructure as code from your devil to my <laughs> one without seeing it written anywhere. You're not going to like the way that I set up my database. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that sounds like a, a learning opportunity. Great. So this is what I was just kicking off as Adam was uh, chatting. But what we've got here is my, I'll run this again in a second. So right at the beginning, so I have this uh, Azure DevOps kind of space, so just called Sandbox really nicely. And inside here, we have all of my kind of stuff. So bicep, can we see this? No, no, no it's a bit tiny. Could you make it bigger again, please? Okay. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's nice and big. There we go. That better? Yep, okay. much. So this is the file we were just, or the file structure that we were just in. So uh, this is the thing. Um, is everybody familiar with DevOps? Does everybody need a? I, I'm not sure I know what that is. Okay, so as your DevOps, to be quite frank, is one of my favorite tools that's come out in recent. It just does everything in here. If you're familiar with like working with Jira and uh, GitHub or Bitbucket and these kind of things, it's just basically all about just in in one place. Um, it's quite it's quite neat. It's uh, it's very nice to have it all in, and then you can have all your kind of your Kanban or your Agile boards in there as well, and it can do a load of other kind of stuff as well. But all I'm really focusing on the moment is this git repo here and inside this git repo is exactly what we've kind of just had a look at which is all of the bicep and stuff so here's our azure yaml pipeline uh, what we can do from here is if we want to create a new pipeline we can zoom out so it just keeps bouncing down. There you go, pipelines. Okay, so we've got a series of pipeline here running everything. It's quite easy to set up a pipeline if I wanted to do a new one. Because we've got that YAML file there, we can just come in, we can click on it, we can find the repo that we want to be looking in. So in this case, it was the uh, function app inside there. We have an existing pipeline YAML file. And because it's got lots of stuff in there, we can find that and off we go. Um, I've already got one of this name, so I reckon it might have a bit of an issue with that. But this is what you'll get. Um, and in our case, we can just run this. If we were to push anything to here, because we have this pipeline defined as triggering um, on main, because I'm a bit rogue and I'm not following any best practice, we push everything into main. <laughs> so no pull request, no nothing. No, 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 straight no, no. In. One, one man does everything. So, but you can have other kind of triggers on here. You can have this. So, if we were kind of having a feature branch, a test branch, or something, you can have it so that it runs on certain things. So, if you wanted like a POC kind of branch, you could make sure that this didn't trigger and therefore kind of deploy into things. In this case, as I say, it's all in. It's all in main. And what we've done then, okay, we can just run, if we just run this pipeline. This is where we could pass in variables on the, you know, so if we were to define any that we can kind of want to pass in again, you can at that stage, if you really don't want people kind of playing with the files, you can get them to pass in whether they want to kind of a node or kind of C sharp environment, or whether they want kind of what version of it they want. These kind of things that may be kind of wanting to be external. Passwords for databases, for example. Or, part, or you could stick them in your JSON file. 
as we will see, as we will see in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, one man. <laughs> so we kind of run this and off we'll see. Um, this YAML file has been set up for a build and deploy stages. So in our build, all we're doing is we're validating that kind of bicep doesn't have any kind of errors in it. And then we'll move it over to, it'll take a couple of minutes, but you can see all the different kind of stages. And if you're familiar with kind of YAML files, you can define all the kind of the stages that you want to see. I've got a UI application. So inside there, I've got installing linting, uh, you know, uh, testing these kind of things before we then do the deploy stage. <clears throat> and it'll tell you what it's kind of doing all the way kind of through here as it kind of goes. And then once that's kind of done, we should be able to kind of go back into here to my resource group. Ah, there we go, number four, scenario four, perfect. And there it is. So now we have reusable, mod reusable modules, externalized config, running through a pipeline. You could effectively now basically say that people don't need to touch certain things. We've very quickly, very easily, made a set of reusable instructions that allow us, or people like myself as developers who don't necessarily know what best practice in an organization is gonna be for setting up certain kind of commute, compute things to be able to kind of do this very easily. Um, which I quite like, to be honest, I think that's really nice. And one of the kind of the nice things about these deployments is you can see what's happening in these kind of deployments. You can see whether it's succeeded. And then if you click into one of these, um, you can have inputs. So these are the inputs as to kind of it'll tell you where it's been, tell you all the kind of the information uh, here. So we know that we're deploying into East US as the storage account name, kind, these kind of things. And these are all the kind of the properties that we've been passing into it to start with. So we know it's a node um, function app on version 18. There's my cause thing, which is, I, I do like that feature that I can just kind of do it through here. And then there's a bit more kind of stuff. If we were to be doing something like a um, App Insights, App Insights spits you out an instrumentation key kind of at the end. So you could see that in your outputs effectively. It wouldn't be an input, it would be an output as to kind of what uh, you get at the end there. And that is it at its simplest. There's the, unless there's any other kind of things that I haven't thought of, there's the nice kind of evolution of how really we can make this whole process very well, streamlined and not have to touch anything. Any kind of questions on any of this? Okay, good times. I'm just going to delete this. Uh, and then, yeah, I can delete it quite easily. Uh, what happens if there's, if part of this thing is pulling the, the source down, uh, but the, from the, from the development uh, area uh, to the local machine so the developer can work on it, and he's working on something, uh, and but he wants to keep the the rest of the software up to date so that you know he, he knows that whatever he's working with is is the latest that's there, makes it easier down the line. What happens then if if he brings the source down and and, uh, and it messes up what what he's already done? So because this is all going through a Git repo, this is all source controlled. So if me and you and so i've already checked the file out no one else could change well if you've checked it out your local version might be different to what i could also be working on it right. i could change it i could push it that means you're behind what we would effectively class as the main branch or at that stage we would be looking for you you might have a merged conflict or something but if we were working off the same kind of source code I'd expect you to kind of be reviewing what I was putting in. So you'd know it would be kind of coming up. You wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't want any hugely surprising issues to be right. having. But with this, uh, nicely, as a developer, you're not necessarily going to need to change too much. The things that you are going to need to change in here are that main file, which will really determine what you're deploying. So we wouldn't be deploying kind of the, the SKU, SKU names and these kind of things, because that would be handled by our DevOps team as a developer or someone, I'd be coming in and going, I want an app service, so, you know, I want a function app, I want these kind of things, and I'd just change that main file. I could deploy it to an individual branch of myself, like a feature branch or a test branch or something, deploy all of that without having any merge conflicts there. The nice part about that is if it all blows up or someone gets a cost alert saying it's been, you know, overly expensive, you have a version controlled part of it that you can go, that's what I deployed. 
uh, why is it so expensive? And they can look at it and kind of see as opposed to a bit. So question about the JavaScript. Is it legal JavaScript or is it something else? Is it legal JavaScript. Like if, uh, can you show the JavaScript code again? It does not look like there's some there's some hinky things going on there. That's a word. No, the JavaScript, the source code, the bicep. The oh, okay. So no, I don't think that's JavaScript. But the bicep isn't JavaScript. Bicep is YAML. Yeah. Not JavaScript. There was JavaScript that you showed. What was okay, that? Let me let me go back. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. Was it in the web app or was it was it in my IDE or was it on the web page? Like you were defining Azure resources in some language. Uh, and it well, you're right, the modules. He said the modules is there. Yeah, you look like it's a JavaScript. I guess it's a biceps. Yeah. All right, everyone explain it to me. But yes, I am actually really curious. All right, so not that part, but the sister sibling file. He's that, talking about the module. They said okay, module. yes. Okay. So that's not JavaScript. No. Yeah, it's not that JavaScript. is not JavaScript. No, sir. It looks a lot like it, it is. It's similar, yeah. It's, it has a programmatic uh, module-like feature yeah. to it, and that's deliberate. You know, it is like a module. Is it? Yeah. Okay. I'm accustomed to Terraform, and I hate their language, so I yeah. was hoping it would be actual this JavaScript. Is, this is done by the people who hate it. Or, I mean, <laughs> similar people to me. You can just say it nicely. People have similar problems as I do. But but the, the, the cool thing about this one is this is a superset to ARM, so it translates eventually to ARM, okay. and it actually can trans it can convert ARM to the bicep to the CLI. That that okay. is a good point, sir. That was yeah. part of my demo. That was yeah. we we seem to be stealing my thunder. Basically. You did oh, get a comment. Man. <laughs> Online comment. I didn't know you. I thought you'd even finish. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Number four. <laughs> Let's see. Well. <laughs> to be honest, interestingly, this was one of the questions that uh, I'm around the back that Tony asked me the other day, and I thought it would be kind of a good one to demo. So I have a resource group here, inside said resource group. What we'll do is we will create a function app. There was a question, actually, down the line. I had a question. He's curious about the state file. Translate says that uh, Google says Bicep does not need state files. Is that true? You, you, you don't have it's a Google, Google, right? Terrible. Uh, not sure. Translate to all. I can answer that. So Terraform has state files, um, which you probably know all about. Um, yes. Uh, Bicep does not have state files. So Terraform uses state files to make a record of what the infrastructure looked like before it touched it and after it touched it and it uses that to do diffing and so has a lot of benefits but also some risks bicep doesn't have state files at all it goes and looks uh, what's there at the time you run it and does uh, diff on what's there and it's still item potent but does not rely on a state file at all what about environments like staging environment in production, how do you manage it? Yeah, so that's driven by the config file. So effectively, with inside your config file, you can pass in a parameter that says which environment you want to be running it out of. I will show you that in one second. Uh, cool. so if we skip through this. Am I, does everybody know how to use the portal to set up a function app? Has everybody done that? Yeah. Do you want me to go? I've forgotten how to do it. There's <laughs> <laughs> always one. Always one. So at the very beginning, we're just going to decide, define which subscription we're going to put it in and which resource group. In this case, we're not going to create a new one. I've got my testing box resource group there. We're going to give it a name um, and we're going to tell it what we're going to do. So a container image being like Docker or something like this. Um, code, uh, we're going to have it as a node runtime. We're going to use the version eight, latest version of 18. And we're going to stick in the East US region. This is pretty much similar to what we've just deployed using the bicep. Uh, host uh, consumption plan will be, we'll do it on that. Then we'll define the storage. So again, these are all the in different pieces that we've defined within say, the uh, bicep template. So it's the storage, storage account there. We've got networking, uh, monitoring. We'll turn that off. For the time being, we'll just do the deployment. You can give it tags again. You should always tag your stuff. But, and nicely in your site, in your bicep, you can write tags for stuff as well. So you can create your own tagging definitions and all the rest of it in there. Um, but I haven't. The bit I wanted to kind of show you was this. When you get to review and create, and it validates what it's kind of going to be doing for you. At this stage, the portal is just going to basically create uh, your ARM template. 
it's going to create all, all of that. And if we, as soon as it does validate, it's taking its time. Oh, come on. Uh, when it does validate, then now. <laughs> There's going to be a thing down the bottom here, download template for automation, which I can't click on yet until it's validated. It's taking extra long because it you're demoing. Definitely taking a long time. It's normally pretty instantaneous. Drum roll. <laughs> so you, what you do now is you say, picture this. <laughs> yes, picture the scene. Yes, okay, we'll just... Uh, You may want to give it a unique story name. Uh, all I want, well, I'm not going to deploy this. I just want to demonstrate that if you want to see the ARM templates that come out of it, you can download these templates, and here's your ARM templates at the end of it. So this is what Bicep is kind of wrapping itself around so that you don't have to write this. Um, You'll notice it has a parameters file here with all the kind of stuff uh, that we've been passing in in our external config files. You've got your resources at this stage. This one has a, a App Insights um, component on it, but ultimately you can see that it has um, everything, the same kind of things that we had on ours. And then you can see how it passes in all of its config here, and it just goes on, um, and then you can see again. What you can do with this then is you can download this and you can run a command and it will turn it into Bicep. Now the easier ones such as this will probably nicely compile into kind of a bit of Bicep so that you can use it if you want to use it as Bicep or turn it into modules. If you've got some more complicated ones, the one that I did for my uh, Postgres flexible server, when it turned it into Bicep, it did throw a lot of errors. Um, which because it just didn't like what it was doing, which was really handy. You can still work your way through it. It's not like it's unreadable, but just be warned, you can't straight up copy and paste them sometimes because they don't like it. So any questions on that? Because that's, I suppose, the the crux of... So you, so you can import, I, I know there are some tools that you can import from your Azure deployment all the way into Terraform and all those. Like, can you deploy the same thing into biceps? Deploy. In. Uh, not deploy, the, the import. Import into. Im import bicep. into bicep, uh, bicep code, so bicep score. This thing can be imported in bicep. Oh, this yeah. is the one of the. This like, is ARM. So this is ARM. ARM. Yeah. ARM. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this can be imported. Yes. In this is JSON. Converted. Yeah, the oh. bicep CLI. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is JSON. Yes, yeah. you can it's take awesome. that and reverse engineer it in bicep. But, but using tool or you are just uh, using a CLI. Using oh. a CLI. Yeah. Bicep CLI. Oh, there okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, gotcha. Ah. And this, this is kind of exactly. ugly. Arm is kind of ugly. It's kind of a pain. Uh, bicep. Nobody is, likes arm. No one likes it. Uh, but bicep, which is an awful lot like Terraform, unfortunately, yeah. just. Just to be candid, very light Terraform, uh, but it's easier than, than ARM. So it's yes. much more, so it's the same thing. Same end result, it's infrastructure as code, but a little little easier to work, well, a lot easier to work with. Actually. So I've actually got an example of it here. If I can make this bigger. One of the cool thing about the bicep is that if you want to run you something very like, let's say like under deployments, and it says it fails at the resource uh, 60, something or 70 something. Yeah. It does not do all the deployments and then fails. It does the check first. All right, so got then you. do the deployment, then similar to, to Terraform. Yeah, Terraform does it too. Yeah, exactly. Zoom in. Similar to that. Uh, zoom out. So that's one yeah, of the things. That it does through, I mean, it does the pre-build and then yeah, exactly. keep the state and yeah. then, then exactly. that state you can. Yeah. Well, one of the thing I was not liking with that is uh, it, would, uh, it would delete existing uh, resource and then recreate everything. You can you can do it at this, this strategy. I mean, you can do, define different strategy, or if you want to recreate, and you can. I think yeah. by default it doesn't delete, right? It 
doesn't delete. You can have it either but potently can, update what's missing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But you can you can override that. You can set it just to whack everything and re rebuild it if you want, or do the what if it won't touch anything. Is that both Terraform and the and the biceps does a similar? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. will show you what will change. It will, if you rerun it, it'll show what exactly. new machines it'll create. Yeah, or whatever resource you'll want to read the plan. Just, just <laughs> check the plan before you run it. <laughs> I will tell you in Terraform, it has almost deleted our entire. That stuff. is very true. So that is the, the reason why I was like, oh, Terraform, I still always stay run away from. from it's risky. It's risky. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard of bad yeah. things happening. Well, another advantage is like new infrastructure. Don't, don't do something. Do yeah. do yeah. Okay. So yeah. this is uh this is arm right here. I believe there was a question popping up, but this is an ARM template. And what I've done here is I've used, I forget the AZ command, and it spits out, um, spits out things like this. So what it'll be doing here is that uh, this is the flexible server one. So has all bits in it, and again gives you a couple of errors, but it's pretty good as when it spits it out. So you have parameters one and a template um, for each of your resources, and the template is effectively what we had as our module and then your parameters would be the config file and then it builds you up this is where it started to confuse itself it actually wrote that in there i don't write that in there to do fill in correct type that's what um that's what it gave me <laughs> so, it didn't complete the job interesting yeah. so and then you know nicely though it does do stuff like this which it parameterizes api versions and things like this which is quite good so and then what we've got with the ADA, the admin stuff as well, which is quite good. So whenever you do want to kind of build something, if you are a bit kind of confused as how to do it in Bicep, and because the schema gives you a list of every property it can have, if you want something like a quick, nice, easy way of doing it, checking out the ARM template, compiling that into Bicep is quite a nice, it's quite a nice way to do it. But it's, you do need to fiddle with it a little bit. Um, don't say Okay, so finally, then I suppose for the last thing um, on doing this one is I have here. I'll close all of this. So what I've got here, if you think back to the actual kind of little bit of a demo, uh, a little bit of a presentation at the beginning, this is a main file that we're going to build with a function app. We've got a we've got a database that's our flexible server. We've got a web API, and we've got an API uh, a UI there. And as you can see, the web, can you see this? Is that too small? Is, are we good? Fine. Okay. Okay. So. These are both. <laughs> these are both um, web apps. These are both um, app services. They use the same resource under the hood here. So if we were kind of giving this to a development team and we're saying you can kind of use this, all they would have to do is kind of copy and paste these modules for however many they wanted. Um, and I think that's one of the absolute powers of this is that it's so easy to kind of do. I've had to change this location because it's free tiers and I couldn't have lots of free tiers in the same regions. So, and then you just give it a different name and that name defines, obviously, it differentiates the resources. So one thing that I changed here, which I think we covered earlier, was this whole thing was initially targeted to um, my subscription. So that's another thing you can do. You can basically target where you want your bicep to run. And then in this case, we were running it in a subscription, which meant that we could build that resource group. This one, because I'm doing it for a pipeline and I've got, uh, it's running with the AZ uh, CLI, I've changed that so that now the CLI builds the resource group and it just deploys all of this into it. But again, there's nothing really changing here. I've just got three different kind of config files, one for my environment, <coughs> that this goes to the dev test kind of thing. So you can have your dev test in production and you got your firewalls and your admin access for things. And then each of my modules kind of down here, which is just my resources. So we can change all of that. Uh, 
have a pipeline for all of this. So this is my full stack one here. And I'm just going to run it. Uh, and off it will go and it should if uh, there's no issues. Take a minute or two to kind of do. But what this now is doing is it's just running that entire dump of bicep that we've created inside uh, inside here. And we shall see it when it pops up in a minute in here. First, it will create a resource group and then it will put everything inside of there. So there's. So while that's ongoing, the next bit then I suppose is to push all of our repos that we want. So while this is happening, we have a selection of other repos. So we've got a function up here, which again, is just bare bones. Okay, sorry, I missed that. There was a comment in the Teams. Yeah, I'll find a confirmation. Um, again, so we just have a function app here that's going to run through the YAML. Um, it doesn't do much, to be honest. It's very, it's very basic. We've got a UI that kind of does the same, uh, and an API. So as soon as that, as soon as that deploys, there we go. So now we're deploying everything into there. <coughs> and hopefully, so that's the resource group that we've created down there. Uh, it should hopefully be coming up. There we go. There's our resource group, and inside the resource group, as these kind of do appear, they'll kind of go. Fortunately, this is the part where it takes a minute. Any questions so far on what's kind of going on? So this now hopefully is going to deploy an entire application tech stack in a resource group in our subscription. Did you want to mention, because that was what Tom has mm. questioned, so the, you, you use an extension for VS Code to help you, right? Uh, so there, there is a nice extension for VS Code. It, I'm a paid up member of JetBrains, but... You've, uh, you've got a, a bought tool, okay. There is a there is a freebie. Well, there is That's one you're using or you use JetBrains. I use IntelliJ basically and WebStorm for everything. Oh, but VS Code has the best bicep extension. The man who or the person who created this is I absolutely love it. So if I find maybe uh, that's the same reason because they work for Microsoft. Potentially. <laughs> potentially. <laughs> no, um, who built it, right? Who built VS Code? No, the bicep. Bicep. Yeah, like the actual. Yeah, the, the language. Microsoft, yeah, the guy, the the AKS guy. Um, he's a um, random Burns. He's is the co-founder of co-creator of Kubernetes. I didn't know yeah. he created it. He, yeah, he was the one who came from Google to Microsoft. I don't know who created Bicep. Yeah, he he's the one. Oh, I see. Yeah, Brandon Burns. You know him, right? Yeah, Brandon Burns. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's he's very very smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So this is my favorite extension uh, on here. And this basically is just a visualization of what's kind of getting deployed. So it's, uh, and it will flash up red if there's any errors and stuff on it. But you can see here what we're kind of deploying uh, to app services. Um, this is the tool showing. Yeah, so this visualizer on the on the right hand side, it's. So I have. I have some questions related to some of the configuration of uh, some resource. Say you have some app services that you want to uh, install certificates on it or query its uh, IP addresses and all those. Uh, is it possible to do that through you, the through the biceps and, if you and then configure them then to the next step that you want to do? Like you want to say, you want to know the IP, but then the back end you have something there. There you want to open the port uh, uh, IP. 
I know if you want to see any kind of information about something that you've just deployed, there is a way that you can print out the outputs of it. So when you go into the deployment center, you can see what the outputs are. Basically, I say querying as a JSON output and then, then grabbing them. Basically. You could do that. But all Bicep also supports the concept in the same way as you have parameters being sent in. It has uh, outputs being sent out. So oh, right. you can set the values of those outputs in your Bicep and then query those in subsequent files. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So, okay. So and that's and how then you, you can you can configure your certificates through your deployments as well. Uh, you can uh, chain those together. Yeah, I think you can. I think oh, you can chain all of them. You, you can you can chain stuff together. Uh, in some cases, you can do it all in one deployment. In other cases, you might need to have something deployed and then and, uh, and then a subsequent step uh, update it with something. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, Kubernetes is a common, uh, AKS is a common one for that. Deploy a cluster and then configure and deploy other stuff on top of it once the cluster's there as a subsequent step. Yeah. Think, things like that. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, that was the depends, I think it depends on kind of parameter that you can't oh, depends on. Oh, and then you can basically say don't run this because otherwise I believe everything else runs in parallel. It does do it in parallel, yeah. I should do depends, which uh, means it's right. Okay, it depends on step in then. Okay, right. right. Yep, yep. And then you can, yeah, so if you want to set firewall rules, for example, based upon IP addresses, then you can wait for the resource to create and then pull out its IP address as a value and use it for subsequent steps. Yeah, I see. Yeah, gotcha. That's what we kind of do in here. Yeah, so we build a flexible server first, and in this instance, so this is my Postgres flexible server. We build that, and then at the bottom, then we can add our admins and then our firewalls. Oh, I see. So, and this depends. So we've got this. Both of them depend on that flexible server kind of being there. So they won't run until after it. Oh, I see. I don't think that has to depend on the admin's been there. That's correct. That was going to finish before that would happen. Yes. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one of the neat things about this is you can do uh, conditional stuff in here as well. So if you don't, if that's obviously set to false, you won't do that at all. This one's just looping through. So my config for this is, um, yeah, so it's a list. Are we all right there? I'm laughing about is it, is it Terraform has the worst syntax in the world. Okay. So an if statement, I love if statements. They're really, it's, it's, they have the word if in them. You can read it. It's really simple. It is the best design pattern in my, it's the most, most used design pattern. So yeah, and that's basically because we've got a list in here. So you can define as many as you want in here and then you'll just loop over them. And for each one, you'll create, um, where were we, in here. And for each one, you'll just kind of create a new set or a new resource for so it's, it's quite nice it works it works quite well um and then if we go back to here so to your point about inputs and outputs in your deployment section these are the inputs that we're putting into building something you've also got outputs that spit out here so the best example is app insights because it spits out an instrumentation key at the end and that's where you'd find things like that. So if you needed to know anything about the resource that you just deployed, you can print it out into here. Yeah, you, you define it, you, you define it uh, in the same way you define a parameter at the top. You were showing parameter name and then the type. And so you do the same thing, but it's called an output and then a, a type. And then you set, you set a value to it elsewhere in the screen. And then it, it holds that value at the end of the run. There you go. And that is everything now deployed. So that's an entire full stack application for somebody to use. You could obviously take this further and have virtual networks and all of these kind of things kind of set up and deployed with it. So you could kind of secure it for all of that kind of stuff. I've whitelisted everything for this again. Um, <laughs> it, it, it works well. Um, and well for demos. For demos, uh, yeah. right, it's good to say. Just, uh, just while we're at it, while we're kind of talking about things that Adam wouldn't advise on. Uh, so this is my flexible server um, in here. Uh, is this the right bit of config? Um, there was how not to pass the password. Basically, I'm going to give you. A, <laughs> there you go. Red-handed <laughs> password. Yeah, don't don't do that. Oh uh, yeah, should I do that? So but, that should be a parameter which you yeah. pass in from your DevOps pipeline as That's a it, secure yeah. environment variable. Yeah, yep. yeah. No, definitely, yeah. definitely don't do that. But it. It works quite nice. Yes. For the purposes of a demo. <laughs> the purposes of demos, yeah. A demo of what not to do. 
It's all about it's all about moving fast. <laughs> right. Um, right. So what we can do now is because we have this up and running, we can go into these. So we'll start with a. We'll start with this. Here is all of the information for it. <coughs> Uh, and I suppose, again, if you've never kind of made things uh, like this, there's a bit down on the side that tells you how to connect to it all, which is quite, it's quite handy. So we have uh, this bit here, so I'm just connecting through, always the same kind of port. And as I told Tony at about 11 o'clock at night one day, just remember to actually define what your database is there, otherwise you'll get nowhere. Yeah. It's, it, sound, it sounds stupid, but um, yes, I did that. So uh, we'll just stick that in there. And we'll stick that very secure password in there. File that, test that connection. Hopefully that should go green. There we go. So we've got that kind of up and running. What we can do now, if we open up the, oh, how am I going to do this? Now, I have <clears throat> so we're just going to dump some data into it. This is basically just data that I've acquired. It's Houston weather data, and oh. yeah, <laughs> basically. Worry about formatting that. There it goes. So that's created our table in there. We're now going to run this, which is just going to run our. It's basically just. Oh no, we're not. We're going to take that first and change that. You could do this as part of your DevOps pipeline, and yeah. You can. Yeah. So. Make it work. Did have a um, function app that did all this for me, but it was not, it's not fit for purpose, shall I say? Um, and then we just change that to go in there, get rid of that. Yeah. There you go. So we stuck near on 400 lines in there, and then we can select all of that just to prove that it has actually kind of gone in. And there we go. So now we've connected from our local machine to um, our database, we've seeded it with some kind of data so we can actually use it. So now. Mean temperature 38, that doesn't sound right. Is it what, sir? <laughs> mean temperature 38, that doesn't sound right. It's not too great. I can't vouch for the validity of any of that data. <laughs> I literally just got, there was 4,000 rows of it, and I was oh, just okay. like, I'm just going to strip out the first handful. So That's kidding. <laughs> it, it, it could be the weather data of a car shed somewhere, to be honest, I have no idea. Um, okay, so once we've done that, what we want to do now is we want to start kind of actually deploying some of our application. So again, we have a pipeline that points to our repo. Each of the repo has the thing. So we create a service connection. I'm quite happy not to go through the stage of doing all of this because I appreciate we're now running into quite long for this. Um, I suppose so the best and last thing to kind of see is the service connections. So all a service connection is doing is it's making that join from our pipeline into um, Azure 
So from DevOps into Azure, we're going to do it using the um, resource manager one. There's one for everything, to be honest. There's a whole load of stuff in here. Um, and then we'll use the recommended one. Yes. So um, this is where I need. No. How many of you use this code to log in because you've forgotten your password? This is <laughs> second factor, right? This is, this is two factors. So this is I've got the I've got the app with the fingerprint, um, or I use the the number that sends me an email. Well, well, you use two factors. That's it. So I get some things right at least. You know. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. Now's a good demo. There we go. So, OK, so what we're going to do here is basically we just kind of tell it the subscription group that we're going to go into and a resource group, which we're going to allow. We're going to grant everything kind of permissions and give it a name. Um, managed identity all the way. It works really nicely, to be honest. It really, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it just takes the hassle out of having yeah. to kind of provide a load of. Don't have to worry about no secret. <laughs> that, that's it. Playing around. Convenient and secure. Ah, yeah. that's it. I don't need it stored in a JSON file somewhere. I'll post it now. Right. Rotation. <laughs> All right, so inside here. Now, this is my uh, YAML file for here. So we could change this, which is my connection string. So that's that. And this, the important bit here, this is the name of the pipeline that we're running. This is the name of the web app that we're going to kind of put it onto. So in our case, because we have UIs, APIs, and all of these kind of other things, we're going to basically go, go into here. That one then is our API there. Take that name. Yeah. So because we're using these as variables as well, we only define it once and then it's just going to get used elsewhere. Uh, again, we're going to merge it straight into main. Um, and I believe that might work. Straight to main. Straight to main. <laughs> you don't need no review process for this. There's no. Straight in. Doesn't need any. I didn't, I didn't move to Texas <laughs> not to be a cowboy. So. Nice. We keep using uh, it. <laughs> so, and what we should see here in our pipelines is this kind of running. Here we go. Kick it off. Again, burn deploy stage. Once this kind of goes through here, we should see it here. And again, we should be able to kind of go to this now. We'll open this up in a minute. Drum roll. That's it. I'm wondering now if. My plan wasn't finished, right? Okay, that's the start command. Yeah, no, it's not. It's still deploying it. Definitely quicker if it wasn't a demo. Yeah, definitely way quick. Well, it's not bad. 19 seconds. I, say, I was about to say, it's not doing much, to be honest. It's not testing and linting and, you know, no, my huge. Filing. Yeah, there's no huge. I think it, unit tests. That's it. Well, yeah, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> why, why enforce any standard now? <laughs> <I> mean, like, <laughs> it would be crazy to enforce standard now. <laughs> I'd like to say for this demo, I have slimmed all this back, you know, just to make the demo faster. But yes, you would have tests and all the rest of it. And I wouldn't have my passwords in my JSON. So. Copilot X type the test for you. 
Um, in the meantime, at least we know the app service is up and running. Um, Almost node 16. Could in theory have this kick off after your infrastructure if you want it. Yes, there is a tag that you can sit nicely uh, about source and you can, once you've deployed something like a web app for the first time, you can basically run that and deploy something from there, which is quite nice. Um, Stop shop. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? Are we still all awake? <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Basically, once this deploys, I, we won't go through the rigor of deploying everything else because you can believe me when I say they're all the same now. Uh, so we've proved. So I suppose the only last kind of thing to say about this is that I think this is a really nice way of allowing people to have the flexibility to be able to kind of deploy anything they want in a controlled environment. And I think it's it works really well for, for devs like me who want to kind of build stuff and demonstrate it to other people, especially when we're working remotely, having something like this where I can come along and go, I want one of those, I'm one of those, and deploy my code to it. It, it works very nicely. If a little time consuming. There you go. So there's... Yeah. Well, Thank you. There is a there is a rather shoddy UI and function app and all the rest of it to go with it, but believe me when I say it, it does the same kind of thing. So what we've done there is we've deployed all of our infrastructure via a bicep file through a pipeline. We've then kind of gone ahead and we've deployed all of our applications to it. So that pretty much concludes all of this bit here. I don't think I've missed any pieces apart from deploying these two at this stage. And that pretty much is it. That's, uh, that, thank you very much. Feel free to clap. I will, I will take your call. Um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Uh, do grab me uh, if you want to know anything else. Questions? More heckling? Any more heckling? Visual tool? This image is from the visual tool. This image is one that I just created. Oh, you created Because I'm a wizard. Like, it's a rather shoddy architectural diagram. But <laughs> not all together, so. <laughs> um, no, it's, that's, all, that's, that's all me. Don't worry, next year all this presentation, I mean, it's going to be done by AI. 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 I guess uh, probably the, you know, the presenter would be uh, some AI robot too. <laughs> I've, been, I've been just waiting for it to make uh, right away. Yeah. 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 It does it do bicep as well. It does bicep. Yeah. Okay. You just need the human to refactor it after it's given it to you. So yeah. otherwise we'll refactor it as well. Oh, stack overflow will give you the code as well, won't it? But it's <laughs> good for a slightly off topic question. Oh, no, because we're talking yeah. about AI Oof. starting to where you've seen it mm -hmm. more in the press yeah. about a six month pause. In the, in the development yeah, I, of it, that's what Elon Musk yeah, wanted. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Because it just, <laughs> it just seems that the good guys are going to be restricted and the bad guys are going to go on and do it and things are going to get worse. Yeah. I don't agree with it. Um, I don't agree with it for a couple of reasons. I don't believe the hype that AI is going to kill us all and wipe us all out. I believe that we can actually use AI for the better and not like some kind of Terminator kind of, if you believe Elon Musk's kind of idea that it's inherently going to kill us all, then yeah, fine, let's ban it. But there's a great book on this called uh, Rage Inside the Machine, which talks about an inherent bias and um, this kind of thing. Fantastic book written by a guy who's been doing AI for all his life, probably started AI movement. Great book. Um, and he talks about it in there. Um, about Who's the author? I forget, I don't know every author's name. Yeah, what I what I feel is that uh, so far humans have been creating various uh, physical machines that can enhance humans physically. Mm -hmm. Now the AI comes and maybe it's it'll enhance mental. uh, mentally. This is it. That will that will only actually speed up a lot of inventions and various things, just like how physically 
we are, got better if we have to do something there, man, mass manufacturing, everything, right? Very same way, I guess the AI is going to speed up on the various things, such so, as, uh, yeah. such as uh, inventions and uh, various things. So rather than the conversation about AI wiping us all out, which I think is a bit of an <laughs> it's a, uh, it's the, better, a... the better conversation is the ethics around AI. If you look at what happened to okay. the artists that were put out of business when uh, Chabby, Chad GPT and things started coming out and really producing this AI generated art. There was a whole ethical kind of movement against trying to ban it because- Mid-journey, that's what it is. Yeah. It's mid-journey. Yeah, yeah. It, that's the one that, that that basically like draws like amazing- Oh really, picture. okay. Yeah, it's mid-journey, it's a different company. All these people who were doing like kind of localized kind of amazing. art draw or something okay. for you for- We did, you know, we tried it. Yeah, 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 business yeah. because of it. And so the ethics around how we use these tools is far more, a great book called Who's Global Village is a great one on this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting. I find that conversation much better than stopping AI from being developed because we're worried that Elon Musk, who's just a lunatic, to be fair, he's just, I mean, he just don't and, and at this time, I think we're going to bring it back. <laughs> yeah, stop the recording. This, this is a good one. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a good one for taking offline. And yes. uh, maybe we should all go down the pub and uh, and talk about this one. Because this is a really good topic, but probably not for the rest all right. of the Elon Musk is going to It's still the That's environment in which you're developing. In, in, indeed. I think more, I, we actually plan having more uh, AI topics uh, as uh, coming up, we heard some speakers volunteer to talk about some of those. In fact, yeah, Stepa uh, returning, he's promised to uh, present something on open AI, Azure Open AI. Azure Open AI coming up in a few months. Oh. Next month, we're going to have one on uh, enterprise <laughs> Azure policy uh, from uh, Marlo Bell. Uh, so we'll have that one lined up. We have a couple of other fun ones uh, after that, including Sepa in the room. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I thank everyone for coming out. I uh, really appreciate it. Who, who learned something? Did everyone learn something? Okay. Yeah, I lost the hands raised. Yeah, I learned something too. Uh, I didn't know about that bicep conversion feature that he was showing. So I, I learned something, so that's good. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming out and we hope to see you next month.